Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. One of the reasons I really enjoyed the Star Wars Galaxy is how it parallels our own. Today we're going to start off our episode by talking a little bit about the Cold War. In 1978, the Afghan Communist Party overthrew the government in a coup and attempted to modernize the country with strict Stalinist-style authoritarian governing. A year later, infighting had destabilized the Afghan Communist Party. Then several anti-government insurgent groups started rebelling against the government, making the Soviet Union increasingly worried about the region. During this period of time, the Carter administration looked at the benefits of escalating the conflict and hopefully dragging the Soviet Union into intervening into the region. By 1979, Carter had approved $500,000 of non-lethal aid for the CIA to give to the Mujahideen fighters. With help from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, the United States began funneling aid into the region in a program known as Operation Cyclone. This would continue to expand under the Reagan administration. Along with receiving training from CIA-funded Pakistani militant camps, the Mujahideen also received small arms communication equipment and other military gear. By 1986, the U.S. famously started supplying Stinger anti-aircraft missiles to combat Soviet helicopters. Although it's disputed whether American sanctions or Operation Cyclone was the main cause for the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, the results were promising enough that covert funding for anti-communist forces would become a centerpiece of the U.S. foreign policy under what's known as the Reagan Doctrine. Decades later, U.S. and coalition forces entered Afghanistan in search for Osama bin Laden and encountered heavy resistance from Islamic fighters. Although claims that the CIA trained Osama bin Laden and his fighters are dubious at best, there is no doubt that CIA-backed training camps and U.S.-supplied weapons were eventually used against coalition and Afghan national forces. Now, for all of you hardcore Star Wars fans out there, this might seem vaguely familiar. During the Clone Wars, the Republic funded many different insurgency groups in order to help them fight against the Separatist Alliance. Instead of using the CIA and Green Berets, they used the Jedi, ARC Troopers, and Clone Commandos. But when the Republic turned into the Empire overnight, many of these paramilitary groups turned against Palpatine. Today, we're going to talk about five examples where that happened. One of my favorite scenes in the new Solo movie takes place on the world of Mimban. For much of galactic history, this swamp planet had been ignored for being backwards and uncivilized. The Mimbanese were an intelligent species that were organized into a primitive tribal society. But during the Clone Wars, the Separatist Alliance was attracted to the planet by a rare element known as Hyperbarite. It had the ability to withstand high energy and high radiation output, making it very useful in turbo laser construction. The Mimbanese were excellent guerrilla fighters and were able to completely disappear into the mud that covered the entire planet, but they were hopelessly outgunned by the Separatist destroyed army. In response, the Republic sent the 224th Division of the Grand Army, Nick named the Mud Jumpers to help the Mimbanese people. The Mud Jumpers helped train the Mimbanese with modern weapons and tactics. They also helped them form the Mimbanese Liberation Army, and together their combined forces defeated the Separatist threat. The 224th Division of the Grand Army was now transferred into the Imperial Army, and they returned to the planet of Miban facing Republic-trained and equipped Mimbanese warriors, and were forced into a brutal stalemate which devolved into trench warfare. 22 years before the Battle of Yavin, Wat Tambor of the Techno Union led Separatist forces to blockade and eventually invade the planet of Ryloth, homeworld to the Twi'lek people. The Twi'lek resistance under the command of Cham Syndulla came to the aid of the local Republic garrison and helped them fight off the Separatist attack. But unfortunately, they were overwhelmed and unable to break the Separatist blockade, causing the Twi'lek civilian population to run dangerously low on supplies. With the resistance completely defeated, the Separatist droid army occupied the planet. Meanwhile, on Coruscant, many senators lobbied for the plight of the Twi'lek people and asked for the Republic to retake Ryloth. Despite heavy initial casualties, the Republic fleet led by Ahsoka Tano and Anakin Skywalker were able to smash through the Separatist blockade, allowing General Obi-Wan Kenobi and Mace Windu to successfully land Republic ground forces onto the planet. Brutal fighting ensued on Ryloth as Republic forces regained ground from the Separatist destroyed army. Eventually, clone forces led by Mace Windu were able to link up with Cham Syndulla's resistance, and together they pushed on to liberate the capital of Lesu. Although considered an extremist by many Twi'leks, Cham Syndulla and his resistance fighters proved themselves during the Separatist occupation and the Battle of Ryloth. After the liberation of Ryloth and the rise of the New Order, Ryloth was classified as a free and independent protectorate of the Galactic Empire. In reality, the Empire had heavily subjugated the Twi'lek people and forced many of them to become slaves, working as laborers and sex workers. But under the careless Moff Delian Moore, Sam Sandula's resistance movement once again flourished, this time under the banner of the Free Ryloth Movement. Using the experience he had gained while fighting with the clone army against the Separatists, 
Champ Sandula almost pulled off one of the most daring assassination attempts against Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader when they came to visit his system. Using Clone Wars era Separatist droid fighters along with saboteurs disguised as maintenance crew, he was able to take down the Emperor's Imperial class Star Destroyer. Unfortunately, his ground team was unable to assassinate the Emperor and Vader when they landed on the ground. Champ Sandula would go on to be a huge headache for the Empire and his daughter Hera Sandula would go on to join the Rebel Alliance. During the beginning of the Clone Wars, Andron's King Ramses Dendup was approached by the Separatist Alliance and given an ultimatum, either join them or be against them. The King tried to remain neutral, but the planet was eventually invaded by Separatist forces. Dendup was deposed and imprisoned, and Sanjay Rash took his place as the Monarch. A small group of Loyalist rebels started a resistance movement and began what is known as the Andoran Civil War. Led by Lux Bontere, Saw, and Stila Guerrera, this motley group of rebels was ill-equipped to fight against the Separatist droid army. Lux Bontere, who had connections with the Jedi through his late mother, the Separatist Senator Mina Bontere, begged the Jedi Order for assistance. Initially, the Jedi Council was split on whether they should aid this group of fighters or not. With training and resources, they get attacked soft targets while the Republic continues to engage them on the battlefield. That sounds like terrorism, Anakin. Because the Onderon leader Sanjay Rash had voluntarily declared allegiance to the Separatist Alliance, the Jedi Order didn't want to get involved in a civil war and potentially destabilize a legitimate government. How we conduct war is what distinguishes us from others. Funding rebels to overthrow a legitimate government puts innocent lives at risk. We can minimize collateral damage by using arms that mainly affect droids. The least we can do is help them defend themselves. Test the tactic while we're at it. <laughs> this could be a great new weapon for us. Eventually, Anakin and the more hawkish members of the Jedi won out. A small Republic team was sent to begin training and equipping the Onderon rebel forces on the planet. While most of their training focused on fighting against Separatist droids, the Republic effectively trained the rebels in asymmetric warfare tactics, which also could easily be used for terrorist activity. Although the rebels eventually defeated the Separatists and Sanjay Rash's loyalist forces, the brutal civil war took a heavy toll on the organization. Stila Guerrera died in combat and Lex Bontori would become the Republic Senator for Andron. A year later, with the rise of the New Order, Andron once again found themselves under the control of a foreign power. Saw would eventually relocate his partisans to the planet of Jeddah. His organization's brutal attacks sometimes wounded and even killed civilians, which helped feed Imperial propaganda that the Rebellion was a terrorist organization instead of a loosely associated alliance of rebel groups. Partisans' tactics were so extreme that the alliance to restore the Republic eventually distanced themselves away from Saw and his organization. The Mandalorian Protectors were an ancient group of warriors who were dedicated to protecting the leaders of Mandalore. During the Clone Wars, the Protectors served as the bodyguards for the pacifist government of Duchess Satine Kryz. Later on, several Protectors, including Fen Ra, were sent to Kamina where they helped train clone troopers and clone pilots. During the rise of the New Order, Mandalore was occupied by the Empire, and Fen Ra and the Protectors relocated to Concord Dawn. They had negotiated a truce with the Empire and guarded the hyperspace route running through the system. When a Rebel fighter wing approached the system to negotiate for safe passage, the Protectors quickly destroyed their A-wings with their own superior Fang fighters. The Rebel commander Jun Sato then authorized the retaliatory attack against the Protectors, led by Sabian Wren and Kanan Jarrus. The two were able to significantly weaken the Protector's operation and capture their leader Fen Ra. The Rebels held Fen Ra captive and in return the Protectors gave them free passage through the system. Eventually, the Imperial Viceroy Gar Saxon caught wind of the deal the Protectors had made with the Rebel Alliance and sent forces to destroy the Protectors. After losing contact with the Protectors, the Rebel Alliance send a unit to go see what happened to them. Fen Ra joins this unit and eventually finds out that his men have been destroyed by Gar Saxon. Fen Ra eventually decides to join the Rebellion after seeing fellow Mandalorian warrior Sabine Wren fight with honor and dedication. Kashyyyk was a strategically important planet to the Galactic Republic. This was because of the numerous hyperspace lanes that ran through the system. The Separatist forces launched an invasion on the planet during the latter months of the Outer Rim Siege. Landing on Kachira, the droid army attempted to seize the Wookiee oil refineries around the area, but were met with a strong combined force of Wookiee warriors and clones. Although they initially succeeded in beating back the Separatist onslaught, in the middle of the battle, Order 66 was executed, causing the clones to turn against their Jedi leaders. As word came out about what had happened, the Wookiees decided to support the Jedi against Order 66 and the clone army. Eventually, the Empire would take over the entire planet with the legalization of slavery. The Empire conscripted many Wookiees into labor camps and used them for the construction of the Death Star. 
After the Battle of Endor, the Rebel Alliance had the opportunity to free Kashyyyk and liberate all the slaves on there, but unfortunately they decided to focus their attention elsewhere. Han Solo was furious by the inaction of the New Republic and decided to wage a personal war against the Imperials occupying the planet, and eventually succeeds in freeing Kashyyyk. Well, there you have it guys, five groups that were helped out by the Republic, but then eventually turned against the Empire, which reminds us of that all-important lesson to be careful when you give other people weapons, because one day they might aim those weapons back at you. Well guys, I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, don't forget all of our proceeds for our Generation Tech shirts and also our Humanity First shirts this month will be going towards Operation Homefront, which is an organization which helps out veterans and uh, their families. So guys, check out our Teespring website and buy a t-shirt, or if you want, you can donate directly to Operation Homefront. We'll link both of those sites down below. So far, we've made around $200 in just the first few days, so great job, guys. Let's keep it going. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.